So I laid hands on her and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And a lady who was bound in a wheelchair for like 40 years, all of a sudden gets up out of the wheelchair and she starts walking the festival field. Then she starts running around the field. Welcome back to Other People's Lives. I'm Joe Sanigato. I'm Greg Dybeck. For anyone out there that would like to be a guest on our show, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our email is oplpodcast at gmail.com. Just send us your story and we will get back to you. Today, we're speaking with a man named Chris Cugini. He sent us an email and the subject line reads, my journey as a minister casting out demons and delivering the possessed. Um, very excited for this conversation to learn more about this. We have Chris on and thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Like I said earlier, I've been watching your show from the beginning, so I'm excited to share what I have to say. Totally. Can you kind of kick this off by giving us your job description? So you're a minister. Um, what does that mean exactly? Is that is it like evangelical church? Like, can you kind of just paint the whole picture of of your job? Yeah. So I'm a uh, Pentecostal minister, which basically means that I travel around the world preaching the name of Jesus. I lay hands on the sick. I cast out demons. I preach the uh, full full Bible, but it's kind of like uh, the the church is kind of like if you know of Joe Olstein or if you heard of Elevation, that's that's exactly the church that I'm a, like involved in is one of those type of churches. So like Pentecostal, non-denominational, where there's a worship team, where there's, uh, you know, people praying in tongues, where there's uh, an actual uh, laying on of hands, casting out devils. So that's kind of where I am. So you, you, uh, when you're saying you like lay hands on the sick, what does that mean? Yeah. So the Bible says that Christians and in Jesus name, we had authority in Jesus name to lay hands on the sick and they shall be well. So laying hands on the sick is basically, um, you know, I prayed for a lady in Dallas, Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, who was in a wheelchair. So I said, to her, God's going to heal you because two weeks prior to me having a giant crusade down in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, I was uh, asking God, who's going to be there? And I was praying and the Holy Spirit, God told me that there's going to be a lady who's going to come in a wheelchair and she's going to be completely healed. So I laid hands on her and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And a lady who was bound in a wheelchair for like 40 years, all of a sudden gets up out of the wheelchair and she starts walking the festival field. Then she starts running around the field. So laying on of hands is basically just, uh, the Bible says that when we lay on of hands, whether it's for healing or just for in prayer, it's just me laying hands on somebody and praying with a fervent boldness prayer. But like I said, that lady was completely healed. Uh, her her daughter, actually, I watched her daughter take the wheelchair and throw it in the dumpster because she said, we don't need this no more. And God gets all the credit. Wait, so what What was wrong with this woman? So, yeah. So this lady was saying that uh, she was able to walk when she was little, but she was in some bad car accident that left her kind of bedridden. And the story is I was preaching in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, and Dallas is so big. You know, I come from Pittsburgh. I'm up north. So I've never been to Texas. But uh, Texas is so big that, you know, we were meeting in a um, big apartment complex, a low income apartment complex. And this lady didn't even live there. She actually lived an hour away, which is crazy. And she was saying that somebody came to her door, which none of my staff went to her door because we did the probably about the the apartment complex and probably the other apartment complex is situated right next. So we never drove an hour away, but somebody gave her a flyer and she came to the meeting. And, you know, the lady that like when I was praying two weeks before, the lady said it's going to be an African-American woman and described her to a T. So when I was preaching, I was worried because I didn't see anybody. But then all of a sudden, in the middle of my sermon, here comes the lady exactly like God dis described. And when I talked to her, you know, afterwards, after she got healed, she was dancing and singing. And she was saying that she was in a bad car accident, which basically left her in a wheelchair. But by the power of God, you know, laying hands on her and saying, in Jesus name, be healed like the Bible commands. She was completely healed. And now she's, uh, you know living her best life okay we have eight million questions now yeah oh yeah so I got a lot of <laughs> that is like do you consider that a miracle i consider that a, a miracle yeah and uh the bible says that anybody that's a christian can lay hands on a sick and cast out devils so many people were like oh it must be specifically for ministers or elders or important people no the bible says in mark 16 that you know but we have authority in Jesus name to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devils. So in Jesus name, as a Christian, if you're a 
born again Christian, meaning if you declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have the same authority as Jesus in his name to lay hands on people and they should shall be well. You know, I preached in um, Africa and um, I had a guy that had a softball size, size tumor. I laid hands on him and says, out in Jesus name, be healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And that tumor disappeared. He literally like looked down and started crying because it wasn't there. You know, I prayed for a 24 year old guy at a crusade here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Lord told me that he was um, suffering uh, with a deaf ear. So I prayed in Jesus name, deaf ear pop open now in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of a sudden his ear popped open he said his he was um, deaf since he was born. He's 22 years old, 23 now, and he could hear perfectly. So what I did was just to make sure that this wasn't scripted, because I always, you know, before I go to any church or any meetings, I typically don't like to talk to anybody besides the pastor and his family before, because I don't want someone to come up to me and say, oh, Brother Chris, will you pray for my neck? I want the Holy Spirit. I want God the Father to tell me during the service what they need, so that way nobody can say, oh, this guy knew beforehand. That's how he knew. I want it all to be from God. I can't do anything in my own strength, but in Jesus' name and his strength, I can do it. So I you know, told this guy, I, I, I prayed for him, and to make sure, you always want to test it. So I asked him to go all the way to the back of the festival field. There were thousands of um, people, and I went all the way to the back, and I'm just speaking normally not even loud. I wasn't screaming. And he was able to hear everything that I was saying. And when that happened, it was crazy. Uh, when I prayed for him um, and he got healed. And then right after that, I had a demon come out. That's another story. So when I did that all of a sudden, yeah, it's crazy. But what, when that happened, all of a sudden, like 40 people rushed to front and was like, lay hands on me. Cause I know that if I saw that create a miracle, now I'm going to be healed. And to me, that's faith. Because if people believe they're going to be healed and Jesus' word says they're going to be healed and I have authority in his name to lay hands on the sick, you're going to be healed. So how do you – so how, I guess what is what is stopping you from just healing every single person you come in contact with? Like if someone is has a terminal illness or something, like, I, like what's stopping you from just healing the entire world? Yeah, so, you know, it's it's like – I understand. There's like a mystery because sometimes I still ask God, how come I was able to lay hands on this guy and he was prayed for and he got healed of his deaf ear, but there's little kids that are dying, you know, Personally, I think about it like this. There's some things that we don't understand that God only knows, and he is bigger and better, so we just have to trust in his plan. But I also believe there's a lot of people that will tell tell me, oh, I don't think God's going to heal me because the doctor says that I have fibromyalgia and it's never going to be healed. So the Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So what you speak out of your mouth, the devil has access to. So if I speak that God's word says that I can be healed for what he did on the cross at Calvary 2000 years ago, I believe it, I receive it. But if I start saying things like, well, you know, I went to the doctor and oh, the doctor says that my leg's always going to be deformed. What you're essentially doing is you are you know, declaring, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're telling God and everybody, oh, I'm never going to be healed. So sometimes it's a mystery. We, we don't understand. But other times I feel like people just will just speak death over their life because, yeah, there could be a creative miracle for somebody else, but they'll say, well, I'm glad that happened for him, but it can't happen to me because you don't know what I've been through. I don't care what you've been through. I know where God's going to take you. And so, you know, I'm go to a church down in Tampa, Florida, and every uh, every month they have a two-week healing school where you can go down and sit under the anointing and learn about why God's a healer, and so many people are getting healed. You know, I had uh, people, you know, getting healed in New York City. I had a young lady who uh, who was dealing with some stomach issues. I prayed for her, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, she was healed. So we just don't always know why some people get healed and some people don't, but it's also one of those things is that, you know, if you don't believe you're going to be healed, 10 to 1, you're not going to be healed because you're letting God know that you have no faith and that you don't have any trust in him. Okay. So there has to be a an initial belief and a, oh, a yeah, receptiveness the to the ability to be healed. But I guess for you and your personal journey, where does this start? How do you discover that you have this capability or where do you even, uh, I guess, find the interest to pursue this? You know, what, what led you to this oh, life yeah. that you're living? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't grow up a Pentecostal. I grew up in a Catholic church. You know, I went to church every Sunday. My dad came off the boat from Italy. So we went to church every single Sunday. I was getting my feet washed by the priest. But while I was in the Catholic church, when I was, you know, in 
college, I was actually friends with a psychic medium, which is kind of crazy about how I went from dabbling in, you know, uh, dabbling in demonic practices to now laying hands on people and casting out devils, you know, all over the world. But the reason why I accepted Jesus is because it was in the same year. My uncle died. Uh, he, he committed suicide. He was found in a cold creek on a cold January night here in Pittsburgh. And that same year, a couple months before, my cousin died of a drug overdose. She was found with a needle in her arm and she died of heroin. So it was at that time I got on my hands and knees at that Catholic church and said, God, there has to be something more. And for the first time, that's when I felt like I heard the audible voice of the Lord. And he told me to go to a specific church, which was a Pentecostal church. There was people with the guitar and people worshiping and people uh, lifting their hands. And at that moment, you know, Pastor Debbie pulls me aside and says, God's going to do something amazing in your life one day. And they kept saying things like, bro, you're called to be a minister. I was like, no, I'm not called to be a minister. I'm just an average guy. You know, I was running a successful photography company. I, I went to school for photography. I was, you know, uh, photographing weddings and babies. I said, no. But then one day when I started attending that, that church, I just would see the pastors on stage and get this warm feeling saying, I think I could do that. And that's how I ended up becoming a minister. Now I travel all around the world. I've been to Africa, to Romania, to uh, Mexico. It just hit over 61,000 YouTube subscribers. Just got over 3 million views on my um, video. I preach on international TV three times a month to over 287 million homes. But Everything that I do, it's all God. He gets all the credit. I can't take credit for anything. I feel like I'm in church right now. <laughs> yeah, <it's got> the, <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, the the, the <laughs> cadence, I, I can definitely, I can hear it. I can hear it that you're definitely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Right. And I actually, and uh, uh, you know, my nose is a little bit stuffed up. So this is not how I usually sound. But yeah. Oh, yeah. I, my meetings are pretty interesting. I always <laughs> tell people. You know, when you come to a Chris Cugini meeting, you never know what's going to happen. Expect the unexpected because, you know, I have demons falling out under in the middle of my um, sermons where I'm casting out demons. I have people getting healed. I have people running around the church screaming, hallelujah. I have drug addicts at the altar weeping. You just never know what's going to happen at a Chris Cugini meeting. But one thing is for sure. You come to the meeting, God's going to show up. You're going to hear a powerful word and your life is going to be transformed. Wow, it's a hard sell. Yeah, but <laughs> th yeah. I also want to like yeah. the demons is where I want to like you say like oh, there's, yeah. there's demons coming out. So uh, when you when you say demons, are you talking about something that you can see, or it's just an energy, or like can you just describe also what that whole process is sort of like? Yeah, so it's actually both. But I want to start out by saying this: possession is real, demons are real, and it can only be expelled by the name of Jesus. So what happens is. You know, most people that uh, want to know where demons originate from, demons actually originate from biblical times over 2,000 years ago. We see that in the Bible that it talks about demonic possession all the time. Satan, also known as the um devil, uh, was a angel, an archangel that really loved God but was jealous of what he had. So because he was so jealous in, in all the glory he was getting, the Bible says that he was cast out of heaven and thrown into hell. And as a result, the Bible says he took one third of the heavenly host, so one third of the angels, and he turned them into demons. So, yeah, demons are if – you, if you're wondering uh, uh, what a demon is in somebody, you know, you're not always going to see a physical demon, but a demon is somebody that's in somebody that is manifesting, uh, that is uh, screaming, that their eyes are rolling to the back of their head, that they are saying some outlandish things, and a lot of people – don't even know they have a demon. That's the funny thing. A lot of people don't know they even have a demon. And so they're very confused when I'm done casting out the um, devil. I have a lot of people that will tell me, I don't know how I got here, but whatever you just did, I feel free. What would cause someone to get possessed by a demon? Okay. So yeah. So that's a good question. So one thing that would cause you to have a demon is by uh, dealing with uh, mediums, psychic mediums, or dealing with uh, something like sa satanic. Like I have a uh, a lady that was uh, head of the coven of witches here in Pittsburgh. You know, they cast out spells and they do all this demonic things. So like basically you could get a demon if you uh, dabble in – uh, satanic practices like being a witch or a or a warlock or uh, you know a lot of people uh, that get demons will um, will you know 
sacrifice their own human beings. Or if you think about Africa, a lot of people that have demons in Africa are because they have lack of a health care there. So when they're sick, there's no hospital. So they go to the witch doctor, which I actually met a witch doctor in Africa. So when they go to the witch doctor in Africa to get healed from their disease or their sickness, instead of, you know, somebody laying hands on them and actually praying for them, you know, the witch doctor is casting spells. So people get uh, a demonic possession by dabbling in like occultic practices such as mediums, such as, uh, you know, celebrating Halloween. Uh, you know, not all Halloween is demonic, but where it stems from is pretty demonic. And then what are your methods if you come across someone who is possessed? How do you cast that demon out and what's your success rate? Okay, yeah. So my success rate is, uh, you know, out of 10, 10 out of 10, because the demons have to come out in the name of Jesus. Now, I can't say that it's a quick thing, but I can tell you that uh, it could take, you know, it could take 45 minutes. It could take an hour. But if you just keep pressing through and keep casting out the uh, demon and declaring the word of God in uh, scripture, you know, if I were to cast out the uh, devil, like if, if I am walking down the street and somebody starts growling or howling like a wolf, which is stories I want to tell you here, uh, you know, I know how to cast out the demon. So the first thing you have to do of how to cast out the demon is, number one, you must identify or ask the demon to be silent. So what does that mean? So that means that the demon's main goal is to disrupt the meeting. So when I preached in Africa, in Morogoro, Tanzania, there was probably hundreds of thousands of people in the audience. And so what happens is your main goal of a minister, of a crusade, is to get people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So towards the end of the meeting, towards the end of the meeting is when you start saying, if anyone wants to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity now. So at that point, the demons are trying to distract everybody from not getting saved. So that's when the demons will start manifesting. And that's when I personally have people that are known as demon catchers. So demon catchers are people that are in the audience of these meetings. So when I start saying, you know, people are going to start getting saved. Jesus is here. I start rallying up the demons. So at the end of the meeting, when we're getting close to the salvation call, they're going to start manifesting. So I start telling them, you know, demons are going to come out. And if you want to accept Jesus, and that's when the demons start manifesting. So that's when I have demon catchers that will pick them up because they're wailing and, and um, flailing and they're, you know, screaming and their eyes rolling to the back of their head. And that's why I immediately identified and say, shut up, be silent in Jesus name. Because like I said, the demon has to obey the name of Jesus. So when I ask it to shut up, it means that it can't distract the meeting. And that's when the demon catchers will bring the demon back to the freedom tent, which is a tent behind the stage where myself or other people are ready to cast out the demon. So the first way to cast out the demon now, this is only if you're a Christian. Not everybody can cast out the demon. The only way you can cast out the demon is unless you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So if you are a Christian, you can cast out the devil. So the first thing you have to do as, uh, when casting out the demon is to tell the demon to shut up. Tell a demon to um, shut up. Now, the second thing, once the demon comes on stage or the demon is in the freedom tent, you immediately lay hands on it. When I was preaching in uh, Africa, there was a lady I said in, I said in the email, a 22 year old lady. She was probably like four four foot two, but when she got back there, she was screaming in a man's voice. She was her she was shaking and manifesting and her eyes rolling to the back of their head. And when I was looking at her, she said, "I know who you are," and started trying to spit in my face. It took five strong men to hold her down. You see, demons have so much strength because they're, you know, run by the devil that it took five guys to hold this lady down. So the second thing you have to do, once you tell the demon to shut up, I said, shut up. That's when you have to bind the demon because the because the Bible says, whatever you bind in heaven will be bind will be bound on earth. So the second thing I did was I say, I bind you, demon, in the name of Jesus. I bind you in the blood of Jesus. And you know everything I'm talking about all comes from um scripture. So after you tell, after you told it to him, shut up. After you bind it, the demon. That's when you get to cast out the um demon and say, devil, get out in the name of Jesus. You have no business being here. I ask that you leave now in the mighty name of Jesus. And more than likely. The demon will um, come out. And this is very important. This is the last step. Number four. 
once you cast out the demon, now, like I said, casting out a demon could take 10 minutes. It could take 20 minutes. It could take two hours. But I'm not stopping until that demon comes out because my God is bigger than any demon in hell. So once the demon comes out, the Bible says you must fill the empty space. So the Bible says that if you cast out the devil and they don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the demon can come back and and hurt them seven times worse. So after I get them set free, I immediately lead them in a, in a salvation prayer, asking them to accept Jesus. Repeat after me with your own lips. They accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then if it's at a crusade, I'll get them baptized because if you're a Christian— you cannot have a demon inside of you. Once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you have the Holy Spirit, no demon can inhabit you. Well, that is quite a process. I mean, <laughs> that is that is, that is uh, pretty intense. It sounds like it's, it gets intense back there. I think we have uh, like the visual of this too. Like we've seen videos and I guess that's my question for you too. Like there's definitely a... I think the general population has an understanding of what these mega churches are, what they've become, um, casting out demons and sort of just how animated and engaged, you know, this whole process can be. Um, but would you say it's gotten a bad rap? Like it's, there's, there's a lot of people who point to this and would say that this isn't real basically. Like, is that something that you've encountered? Yes, people will say it's it's not real. It's it's not real. But I tell people, you know, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm not from Africa. So how did I end up in Africa casting out the devil like a demon? It wasn't like it was unscripted. It wasn't like I got on a telephone and called some guy in Africa and said, find me a lady that's willing to be possessed by the demon. But yeah, a lot of demonic uh, preachers that cast out devils, uh, people will say, oh, it's all fake. It's all scripted. These people, you know, must be must be doing this for the cloud or, 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 or must be doing this for financial gain. I'm not in it for no financial gain. I don't get paid to cast out demons. I do it because I want to see people set set free. And if you look at what's going on in our world or in our country right now, you can definitely tell me that there is demonic spirits all throughout the country. There's evil everywhere you go. And if and if you're watching and you live in a in a country where there's, you know, uh, people being murdered or or certain groups trying to kill kill certain people. If you don't think that that is uh, run by a demonic spirit, then you got to check yourself. But yeah, I feel like we get bad raps because people think that it's all fake, but it, it's not fake because I had a demon that I cast out here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After that guy got healed of his uh, uh, deaf ear, all of a sudden I was I get back on the stage and I was getting ready to to um, preach something, and the Holy Spirit told me. The power of God is all over that lady. So I said, ma'am, the power of God is all over you. And all of a sudden, I heard the Holy Spirit say, wrong power. And I immediately jumped off the stage, and I laid hands on that devil, and I said, you got to shut up. Now, the problem was, you know, there was like 40 people that were looking for a healing. So I told my good friend and mentor, Pastor Mike, I said, Pastor Mike, listen, you and I have cast out devils all around the world. I need you to cast out the um, devil. And the lady started barking and howling like a dog. She was barking and howling like a dog. And when the demon came out of her, you know, the pastor of their of her church had the audacity to come up to me and say, she didn't have a um, demon. Uh, you know, I don't think that normal people walk out of their house barking and howling like like dogs. I think if, if you're doing that, you either have a demon or you have a mental illness and you need to get that checked. Gee, I love how you're just like ready to go at any time too. <laughs> just right. like, oh, you, there's you, a demon you, here, and then you, you jumped hop. off the stage and told an old woman to shut up. <laughs> yeah, because listen, I have authority in Jesus' name. Listen, first off, this is my meeting here. Okay, this is God's meeting. I'm here preaching to get people saved. My goal in life is to make sure that we plunder hell and to populate heaven. My goal is to see people set free from addiction, from, from, from demonic possession. I want to see people healed. But ultimately, my goal as a minister, as an evangelist who travels all around the world, is to see people saved and to go to heaven. You know, I was walking downtown one day, going to have a nice dinner with them, one of my friends. All of a sudden, I'm walking down the street, and this, and this guy starts grunting at me. And, you know, 
my friend just looks at me and as I turn to that guy and say, you foul spirit out in Jesus' name. And he falls on the ground and starts wailing and flailing. And he's screaming and he's drawing attention to himself because that's what they want. The demon wants people to say, oh, what is going on? And I said, you foul spirit, come out of that man now in Jesus' name. And I got a word of knowledge. So the Bible says that God, that, that we can uh, get words of knowledge, which is like something that's going on in our life. And I said, that foul drug addiction goes now in the mighty name of Jesus. So I prayed for this man for about 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, this, this guy gets up and gives me a hug and says, listen, you know, I always knew that I had something wrong with me. And I went to doctors after doctors and psychiatrists, and they prescribed me every medicine under the sun. But one touch, you came here and looked at me and cast out the demon. And now I'm a totally changed person because I tell people, listen, doctors cannot prescribe you anything that's going to take care of getting rid of a demon. My Nana, who I love so much, died a year and a half ago of um, dementia. And so, you know, I told the uh, Lord that I will go to every uh, uh, every dementia house. I'll go to every memory care unit and I will lay hands on as many people that is in there and I will get them saved and set free because I believe that if you're suffering with like dementia or some sort of disease, you know, yeah, you know, it's partly medical, but it's also partly demonic because people that have them dementia will start punching you and screaming at you. And I believe that there's a demonic force, not saying that everybody that has dementia has a demon, but I know from experience by, by laying hands on people that did have um, dementia, I had people set free of dementia because it was run by a demon. Okay. Actually, I was going to add, I guess you just answered it, but like, is that sort of a generalization that you believe anyone that might be struggling with addiction or certain mental illness that it is demonic or just a portion like the symptoms are the same like how do you view that think about it like this you know god is not the one whispering in your ear telling you hey inject that heroin hey smoke that crack cocaine if you're doing drugs most likely you know god's not telling you to um do it i believe that it's partly partly your own free will but it's partly the devil behind it trying to keep coaxing you to do more do this it's all right it's okay it's okay because you know the devil doesn't want you to be set free. The devil hates God, hates Jesus, because it was cast down from heaven into hell. So let me ask you, too, because, you know, I mean, a, a lot of this to people will sound like, all right, this guy is making this up or he's exaggerating or whatever. And I know, you know, you're like, yeah, I know that people are going to think that. And uh, I'm just curious from your point of view, uh, have you ever witnessed any ministers uh, being fraudulent. Like, are are there some people out there that are making it up and actually, you know, making a bad name for what you're trying to do? Like, have you ever witnessed anyone that has kind of done something and you're like, this person has made it up or it's been proven that they made it up? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I never knew the person specifically because they were uh, ministers back in the early 80s and they passed since. But yeah, you know, they were uh, two people that, Everybody was like, wow, they're casting all these demons and are healing all these people. But what was happening was, think about it like this. If you run a show, you have a producer. So the producer was finding people and saying, hey, we'll give you a hundred bucks if you say that this person, mm. if they, that, that you're sick. So then what would happen was when they, you know, they would point out before who the person is and the, the minister would have an earpiece in his ear and the, you know, the producer would say, this is the guy that has the um, demon out in Jesus name. So yeah, there are people that are fake. You know, there are people that are fake and there's people that's giving us a bad name, but there's people like us that I don't care if there's fake people or not. I'm on assignment from heaven to plunder hell. And so, yeah, people can tell me all the time what you're doing is fake. It's all weird, whatever. I don't care because I know I'm doing the right thing and I'm getting people set free and I'm getting them to enter into a relationship with Jesus. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy. Uh, if you would like to talk to a therapist, you can do so with BetterHelp. Uh, you can start talking to a therapist in just under 48 hours, which is very good. Um, and yeah, I think that everyone should be in therapy. I've been in for years now. And uh, I think that it is very beneficial to anyone in the world, even if you're not going through something traumatic or anything like that. It's just good to have uh, someone to talk to, to lay all your stuff on who is not going to be biased or anything like that and can just help you work through everything, uh, 
in going on in your life, whether it's good or bad or whatever it is, it, it can be very helpful. So with BetterHelp, uh, it's also great because a lot of the times people are sort of turned away from therapy because it's so expensive. But BetterHelp uh, is a more affordable option and it is uh, also customizable. You can do it at whatever frequency you want. You want to do it once a week or twice a week or once every other month or kind of sporadically, you can do that. Um, and you set that up with your therapist. You can also, you know, jump from therapist to therapist to make sure you find the right fit for you because that is very important. Um, but yeah, and on top of that, you can save some money. You can go to betterhelp.com slash OPL today and you will save 10% off of your first month, okay? That is betterhelp, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash OPL to save 10% off of your first month. We also have Cook Unity and Cook Unity is such a cool company because, uh, you know, it kind of like hits my demographic perfectly. Uh, I love going out to restaurants. I love, uh, you know, just seeing what actual chefs can come up with because I'm not a great cook. Uh, and also sometimes a lot of the times during the week, um, I don't have time to cook at home. So now with Cook Unity, you can get dozens of chefs, um, who you've seen on TV, award-winning chefs. They're going to be sending these meals that they make right to your home. The meals are delivered fully cooked, uh, just heat, in as little as five minutes. Um, and it's flexible, commitment-free uh, subscriptions. You could skip deliveries, you could pause, or you could cancel at any time. But the point is you are getting uh, award-winning chef quality meals right to your doorstep. And that's what I love. I mean, when I don't have time, instead of ordering some fast food or anything like that, you can get high quality, uh, award-winning chef meals right delivered right to your front door. All you gotta do is heat it up a little bit. So it's nice. Uh, and you can go to cookunity.com slash OPL or enter the code OPL before checkout for 50% off of your first week, okay? That's 50% off of your first week by using the code OPL uh, or going to cookunity.com slash OPL, okay? So go enjoy those amazing restaurant quality meals right in your home. The business aspect of this is it lucrative or can it be? Because I know that's another sort of stereotype of the evangelist mega churches is how much money some of these ministers can make, how much money the church brings in. And then, you know, that kind of stereotype of like the ministers, you know, getting in his Ferrari right now after he preaches and going back to his mansion. So is it, yeah. is it lucrative? Is it lucrative for you? Is it lucrative for some people? How, how do you make a living off of this? So, you know, I don't necessarily make a living off of casting out demons, but here's the thing. Since I'm an, ev an evangelist, I don't work for a specific church, but I have monthly supporters. So I have people that believe in me, believe in my call to Jesus, and they give to my, uh, you know, ministry monthly. And like I said, I travel up on the world to, to, to um, different churches, and I don't ask people for uh, money. I just say, look, if you feel led to um, give, the Bible says— you know, be a cheerful giver. So whatever the Lord tells you to give, that's what you give. But this is what I'm saying, you know, you know, people always say, well, why should a minister have a private jet? Well, why should a casino owner who is uh, uh, taking your husband's money because your husband's cheating on you and he's going down to the casino and he's wasting your college, your kid's college uh, uh, tuitions being at the casino. So it's OK for a casino owner to rob you of your family's money. He can have a private jet. But when a minister is you know, traveling all around the world and he just wants to be able to come home and and have breakfast with his daughter, you know, I know a lot of ministers that have private jets and they'll say things like, look, you know, I live here in Pittsburgh, but I got a, but I have a meeting tonight uh, down in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. It takes two hours. So by having a private jet, he goes, I can go down and preach and I can still, still come back by 11, 12 o'clock and I can make sure I put my daughter, daughter to bed. So yeah, you know, I mean, I don't, there are some ministers that's in it for the money, but you know, the Bible says that if you're doing the Lord's work, you should be paid. I mean, you know, you know, I don't make millions of dollars yet, but I'm believing God that I'm going to make a lot of money because I want to be able to have so much money that if I'm walking down the street and I see a homeless man, I can give him a hundred bucks and say, listen, go get a shower, go get a haircut and go stay at a nice ho hotel for the night. You know, the Bible says when you give, it will come back to you. So these people that that will say, oh, minister shouldn't have nice some things. I understand where you're coming from. But then why is it OK for a casino owner 
Or why is it okay for the strip club owner to have nice things, but not the minister who's just trying to encourage you and to help you in your time of need? Is it just because you think people kind of try to hold it to the standards of Jesus or the Bible of like not yes. living above your means or like, but for yeah. you personally, I mean, it. so I guess the answer is yes, this can be for some people an extremely lucrative business. And it seems like the funding, I guess, comes from the support of the community and of the followers. Yeah, exactly. And I love how like people will say, well, Jesus wasn't, I'm rich. And then I think to myself, you know, when Jesus was unborn, the wise men brought him gold, frankincense, and a myrrh. He was getting blessed with high-end things before he was even born. Like, while he was born, they came to see him, and, you know, they didn't go, oh, we came to see you because we know that you're the uh, Messiah. God, um, bless you. No, they brought him expensive gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So I love when people say, well, Jesus was here right now. Jesus wouldn't be living in an Oliver mansion. Well, I don't know where Jesus would be um, living, but if Jesus is traveling from town to town, if Jesus is going around doing, you know, crazy miracles, it costs money to do all these things. You know, I think that as a minister, you know, that we're held to a higher standard, but I believe that, you know, we're supposed to expect the same things as everybody else. Everybody wants the American dream. Everybody wants a white picket fence. Everyone wants a beautiful dog, a beautiful wife. So it shouldn't be any different whether you're a doctor or you're a minister. Sure. I mean, I think, I think there, you know, in, in certain extreme cases, I think there is a maybe a little bit of a difference that rubs people the wrong way of having so much money. Like, of course, I think everyone's entitled to, you know, if you're good at your job and you get paid well, like you can have nice things. Uh, I think that it's a little different for a strip club owner who, you know, makes a lot of money to have a private jet and, and do this and that. But I think it rubs people the wrong way because this is supposed to be someone who you feel like is helping you and going out of their way just to, you know, do a nice thing essentially. And you're trying to repay them, I guess, with money, uh, every single month. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. and I mean, of course it would rub people the wrong way to be like, Oh, it's you, it's like material items. And, and then it gets kind of conflicted where, um, you know, people kind of feel like, Oh, well now it's easy to point to, this is why they're doing it. And I still think that like, if, you know, to your argument saying like, if they, if I have to go somewhere, uh, and I have to go to Texas, there are planes. I mean, it does, like to to take a private jet and to own a private jet, it takes a a lot of money to get to that point. Um, and you know, you are able to travel and take vacations. And I think that you know, if you make good money, you should you should have a nice car, have a nice house. I think when it takes it to the next level, and you know, that's where people start to feel like, all right, now the intentions are getting a little clouded here because it's starting to feel like this is, you know. Just Starting like purely to little, capitalistic. Yeah. For and, the sake. and yeah. you know, to, to be preaching in front of, uh, you know, an audience of people who maybe are living, you know, below, like who are basically impoverished. And, you know, you stepped off a jet in a $3,000 suit with a hundred thousand dollar watch on, like that would rub people the wrong way. Oh yeah. I totally get that. Oh yeah, for sure. I think a lot of it too, it's kind of like the bad apples of where a lot of these kind of mega church ministers who have that type of money, you then find out they were like pilfering church funds or saying that it was getting donated somewhere, but it actually wasn't, or like yeah. evading tax, or, you know, all yeah. the, I mean, yeah. it is unfortunate right. that I think that like these stories happen and that's what kind of makes people be like, you know, this is kind of now clouding, you know, my judgment here. And I, and, and again, I think that the biggest difference uh, is that, you know, if, uh, someone who's a strip club owner, for instance, because that's the example we used before, people are sort of expecting them to be a type of person who is like, yeah, of course, they, they like material items, they like these things, they spend money on luxurious whatever, and they kind of get a pass for that because they're not trying to do anything except run this, I guess you would describe as like a demonic business or something like that, but someone who's supposed to be a savior of the people, casting out demons, this and that, and making sure people are on the right path, then sort of having a similar sort of path in certain ways um, would make, you know, a, 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 would make some people go, oh, okay, why is, why is there similarities between these two people? You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I think oh, yeah, that right. that's, exactly. that's why there is this mm -hmm. like difference. Oh, oh, of course. I totally under, understand that. For you personally, you don't have to answer this. I think we're just always curious 
if there is sort of like a business element involved in the people we speak to, I mean, ha- what type of life has this created for yourself? I mean, God has been um, good to me. I was able to go on trips. I'm able to go on cruises with my family. I'm able to drive a nice car. I mean, you know, from the time I was little, I always wanted to own a Porsche. And so, you know, you know, not all the money that I used to buy the Porsche came from, you know, uh, the uh, ministry. You know, I, uh, you know, got blessed where someone said, I want to buy you the Porsche because I know what you did for your grandmother. So, you know, the Bible says is that what you sow, you um, reap. So, you know, the lady that was taking care of my um, grandmother, she was from um, Jamaica. They didn't have any money, much money. They didn't have a car. So I was always driving her to her appointments and picking up her daughter from um, school. So when the opportunity came for, for me to get a Porsche and someone says, I want to give you this Porsche. Now, let me tell you, the Porsche wasn't a brand new Porsche. It was a 2017. But but still, when I like went to go pick up the Porsche, the Lord reminded me. He goes, you remember all those times that you sowed rides into Sonia, that you took her places and did things for her? I'm rewarding you because you did something that I see is, you know, giving you nice some things. So, you know, the Bible says that uh, that we're all supposed to be blessed. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, um, yeah I guess before we wrap this up, um, you know, we appreciate all the stories and um, the obvious passion behind everything that you do. And is there just any message that you want to leave listeners or viewers with? Um, you know, we we're talking before we turn the cameras and everything on of just there's an obvious understanding here that uh, the belief from viewers is probably going to be split. It's going to be torn. There's going to be skepticism. There's going to be people who wholeheartedly identify with everything you're saying or have witnessed it firsthand, but just for everyone listening, is there, you know, just a a kind of final message that you want to leave to them? Yeah. The final message message is actually this. Look, if you're not sure that demon possession is unreal, just walk outside, just walk outside and see things that are going on. If you can't tell me that, you know, uh, uh, people doing, um, Satanic rituals, you know, if you if like there's cults that are going around killing babies, if you believe that there's no such thing as demons and you're seeing this, I think you really need to read the word of God. That if you have a demon and you're watching right right now, it goes now in the mighty name of Jesus. I bind whatever demon is attacking you now in Jesus' name. Foul devil out in the mighty name of Jesus. You have been set free by the blood of the lamb and a word of the testimony. If you have a drug addiction, it goes now in Jesus' mighty name. If you need healed of cancer, cancer is being healed now in Jesus' mighty name. So I just wanted to, to share that because there's people that are going to say, I don't believe believe in this but there's people that are suffering so i feel like i had to let them know that look i'm gonna pray for you because i know that my god's a healer my god's gonna set you free so my uh hope is that people would just have a relationship with them jesus that they would actually look into demonic possession and just see that like there are some people that are in it for the money and it's fake but there's a lot of us who are doing it not for our own gain but to help other people, to see people set free, to see people who've been struggling from years and years and years of demonic possession, be able to live a life that God intended. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing all of that and, and coming on the show and taking the time today. Uh, oh yeah, thank you so much. You know, it's, it's a really interesting perspective to hear. And I think that, you know, it'd be cool for an audience to, kind of hear from someone who does exactly what you do. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, you know, the, the, for your time and for being on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And, uh, you, I know you mentioned YouTube channel, um, that you have, so where can people find you if they want to hear, you know, more from you or potentially get in contact with you? Yeah. You just go to YouTube and type in Chris Cugini ministries, C U G I N I. And you know, my uh, picture is of, is of me. So you'll know it's a man with a with a microphone speaking. So yeah, if you want to get a hold of me, if you need prayer or you just want to know more about demon possession or you want to come to one of my meetings or you live in a foreign country and you want to know which channel I'm actually preaching on, yeah, just reach out to me on YouTube and please subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm really uh, trying to get more sub- subscribers so I can uh, uh, get more people involved with the church and to get more people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and to live a life of freedom. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye.
so tough. <laughs> it's so tough, it's man. It's murky. Uh, I, I, um, <laughs> look, I, I, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't grow up with this type of religion, to be honest with you. No. I, I went to a Catholic church. It was just, you know, the guy is up there sing talking the entire time. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's kind of what it is. But I, I did not grow up in like a healer type of mm-hmm, church mm-hmm. where the things that he's talking about are miraculous things that like, if they are real, I can't. Uh, personally, like, it's hard for me to believe something like that without seeing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's very difficult. And also just the acknowledgement of, of, yes, there are people who have made it a show. So they have a producer and they do this and then whatever, and they make it a show. But And that's evil to me mm-hmm. to do that because you're taking advantage of, I would say, mostly older people at, at a certain point. Older, uneducated, impoverished, whatever it might All be. All of those things, that- yeah. And allows the f- them the to. The fact that that does exist is enough for me to be too afraid to trust, I guess, blindly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I would, it would, I don't know. There would, there would just need to be something. And like, we do appreciate, and like, I don't think that all of them are full of shit. Yeah. I don't think that. Cause I do think there are people who are very religious and they believe like, I, I am, I need to help people and I can't heal every single person, but I'm going to try and I'm going to do that through you know, the power of God or, or whatever. And I do believe that, but I, but I also, it's, it's hard to not believe that there are a lot of people, especially the like wealthy Well, that's ones. just a fact. Like it's that hard. There is that they've just turned this into, I mean, yeah. almost criminal to a point for, for some of them, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like, we know these characters, we know these people, we know that this is a job. We know that people are doing this, that they're making a lot of money doing it in some cases. And whether his stories are true or not, not for us to say, but he is, that's his job. Like he's living it. He's out there. He's doing this. He sounds like he fully believes in everything that he's doing. Um, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, it's just murky because it just, it. I don't know. It almost sounds like, a. It's just like a very literal take on everything and like a very literal take on the Bible as well Mm -hmm. of like, you know, what do you say? Like one third of the angels went to the devil. So there's that many of them like actively Mm -hmm. out there all over the world, like possessing and trying to just Mm -hmm. crumble our society. I don't know. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's just not my experience either. Like walking down the street and having someone growl at me, like, I mean, living in New York oh, City. Oh, that's definitely happened. They've peed near me. They've growled. They've <laughs> done lots of stuff, but maybe it was a demon. I, maybe I'm, it I, was fentanyl. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it could be either or. But like, I, I don't know. And, and like I was saying, I mean, I, I don't, because he was making an example that I don't necessarily agree with of like, why should a strip club owner like have nice things, but I can't have nice things. And it's like, it's not about that i don't think it's like you know you can have nice things um but you have a different job than a strip club owner so it's like it just comes across yeah it's like having comfort in life as a blanket statement like that makes sense it's like okay you're a minister you're preaching the word you're doing this like this is your job there's a lot of travel there's a lot of work like be comfortable have resources to continue your job but then you know when you get so specific i it just does feel weird it's like oh no like this Porsche is your reward, you know? Yeah. And, or, or just like, like I said, cause I, I've seen videos online of like certain, uh, ministers, I guess, I don't know like the right terminology, but like talking about like, just like flexing on a crowd essentially, yeah. you know, like about their new car and they just got off a jet and it's like, I walked in and I got myself a watch and I got my wife a watch and whatever. And it's like, you're at, you're at the place doing it to the people who are like listening almost. Mm-hmm. And like, that's where it just gets a little, you know, whatever. And a part of me feels uh sympathy for the people who are actually doing it for real and like want to, you know, I, th- I think that people, you know, if, if you are going out there and you are helping people and you're healing people and, you know, doing that, I think that you should like live a comfortable life and be able to get on a plane and, you know, whatever. Does that mean you need a $30 million jet? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, I think that like, you know, it's unfortunate that these things sort of exist. So it it kind of, I don't know. You're dealing with people who have faith, who want faith, 
who almost desire a blind faith. It's just, it's easy access for manipulation. So it's tough. Like you just, yeah. you know, that falls into the wrong hands. And then it takes a lot of very specific skill sets to be good at that job. Most of which are performative, you know, right. most of which are being larger than life, performing, like understanding the psychology of a crowd or getting someone to believe or, you know, it's, 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 it's what makes it so interesting. And like, we've all seen the videos and we kind of all understand what that industry has become at its peak. And, uh, it's, yeah, clearly you know not it, something a lot of people, you know what it's kind of like, with. do you remember like that era in YouTube where everything was a social experiment? So people would be like, I'm going to go and give to homeless people or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it, it like, it does well. And you're like, okay, they did something nice. And then they, they keep doing videos like that. Like everyone's doing videos mm. like this now, like giving to homeless people or whatever. Then a part of you is like, are these, some of these people aren't, aren't actually homeless. Like you could just tell like their interactions are like kind of like set up and mm, fake. Mm. And it came out later that a lot of those things were fake. So then it becomes this thing of like, okay, should, should the person who like n your intentions now have changed. Like mm -hmm. if you want to do something nice, and you're presenting yourself as like, I'm just gonna do something nice, right? Because it's different, like, I feel like now I'm trying to justify like my, <laughs> my position. <laughs> I was just being Your like- position? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of like, I, like me, right? I'm just trying to entertain people and make people laugh. And then I get paid be if people agree, like are saying, yes, you're doing a good job, right? So that's how I get paid money, right? And then I think however I choose to spend that money is fine, however, if I am presenting myself as just like, I'm just going to give, mm -hmm. right? But that turns into the reason why I'm making so much money is because I'm presenting as like a giver mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a way. And then that's what's gonna make me rich. And I think that's what happened with that YouTube era is where people saw like, oh, those types of videos do really well. Now I'm gonna get this many views or whatever. And that just equals more money. So now my intention is no longer to help. My intention is to make money. Your return, like your good deed is just the return on that investment of whatever you the give ROI out is, is gonna give more. Exactly. And like, but then you could just try to justify your way around any of that. Like, well, I, I'm putting this on YouTube and I'm doing this because like by putting it out there and actually taking credit for the good deed that could inspire others and the world needs more of that. And then if I get paid more because of that, then I'm able to also give more away or hire sure. someone and give them a salary. It's, it's like an endless loop of justification. But I do think that, it's, that it, people aren't idiots and you can look at someone and know whether they're genuine with that or not, because some of them came and went mm -hmm. and there's other people that still do that on yeah. a very large scale and all their entire brand is like giving back to people, donating, setting up this and that. And I'm sure they're rich. I'm sure they're making a lot of money, but they're not popping up in a jet and like in a, in a $3,000 yeah. suit and, and acting like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's weird. I don't know. <laughs> this is a weird correlation, but it's like, it's the closest thing to like rappers almost like they've entered this sphere. Some of these ministers of like, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to go above and beyond to actually be flashy, flaunt the wealth I have. And then, but it doesn't matter. And like, I'm going to talk to the people who are so far on the other side of the spectrum to me, but like, I don't know, maybe we just don't care. I don't know. People sit there and listen to rap and like, you know, Oh, I just put a milli in the bank or so. It's like, you make $40,000. You're like a secretary. Like, why are you, you know, why is this like motivating you? Like, yeah, I don't know. You could I almost be like, like, shut up rapper. Stop, t stop telling me how much money you make. I'm struggling over here. And I'm know? sure people do. That's why some people don't like listening to rap because they're just like, it's just repetitive Maybe, and it's yeah. like a little ridiculous. And like, I, I guess, I don't know. But like, you know, I, I don't know. It's no, I know. And we're look like that. That's, we're just talking in circles now, but I feel like that's the vicious circle is like, once people start to feel like, Oh, your intention clearly changed because now there's like a lot of money involved. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that like, no matter who you are, like psychologically, that'll affect you. Like having a taste or realizing you could make more and then having any business acumen to then turn that into more money and then justifying to yourself why it's okay and good for you to make more money. Like, yeah, where does that end? It's, it's just, it's because it's a good deed, right? So if you're doing a job, let's take a doctor, for instance, we're gonna talk about healers and stuff. Someone who's a doctor, no one thinks anyone who's a doctor 
their sole reason for being a doctor is just to give and to heal and to whatever. Sure. People in, in, in high school or whenever they decide like, I want to be a doctor, they know that's a good career. And maybe the, a part of them is like, I would love to be able to help sick people and whatever. And, and the status That's of both worlds, exactly. right? Exactly. You yeah. get, you get all that. Which to this guy's credit, I guess was sort of his justification for it. Right. Like, Hey, Sh if I'm going to be good at my job and I can help people and be rewarded in that way, like I'm also going to have a portion, like have cool stuff too. Cause I'm good at my job. Yeah. I, I <laughs> yeah. It's kind of what he said. I, but I, I don't, for, yeah, I guess. But again, it's like, so for some of reason, the act just, of what you're pre, because yeah. like, that's the whole point is like, I think when like very specific material things get involved, very yes. modern material expensive things, it becomes blurry. But yeah. I don't know what we're even talking about anymore. All I know is step one to casting out demon is telling it to shut up, which I thought was awesome. Hilarious. And he just kept repeating that. And that was funny. It was really funny uh, when he said, uh, like, <laughs> I just jumped off the stage and told this woman to shut the hell up. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I he's who I want around if a, a demon does present itself. That's I mean, for sure. Obviously, because he's going right right into yeah. the fire to fight this. And thing. listen, before we get out of here, I I don't I don't want you know we're not sitting here being like this guy is full of shit and like no, not you know blah, blah. I'm definitely not saying that. I am speaking about the people who like because and that's why I wanted him to acknowledge that, and he does acknowledge the fact that there are people who have done this before, and that's who I'm talking about. There's no way for me sitting here to tell you what everyone's true intentions is and like you know what it is. I don't think that if you're a, a minister, you should live a life of poverty. Like I don't think that's necessary. Um, I just think that once you start getting into the material type of thing, regardless of whatever, bro, even of me, like what I do. I mean, I, I like try to make people laugh or whatever, but if I came in here with like iced out chains <laughs> and like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I do spend money on watches, I will say that. But like, if I came in here and I completely changed and I'm like only wearing Versace shirts and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And I- yeah, Not you know very saying, relatable like, anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, now it starts to feel like I, I don't even really know your intentions anymore because it seems like this is your priority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it just, it comes across differently and that like changes things. And then when you're talking about people's religion and like healing and those, those are big things. I'm just trying to make people laugh and I would still change people's perception of me if I started indulging in material things like that. You'd be like, okay, what the fuck? But when you're fucking with people's religion yeah. and that. And this you're talking about the afterlife, eternity. Exactly. Like so it's like now that I'm seeing this and now you're popping out like fucking little baby and shit. <laughs> I'd be like, yo, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. And that's what makes it so interesting. We're not sitting here after the fact talking about religion or religion yeah. as an institution or what is true or not. Like, I think what's, it's just simply interesting because we know this role exists, yeah. that there's people who take advantage, either believe, truly don't believe or take advantage in this role. It's just, it's interesting. It's just a reality of religion. Like that has stemmed from religion is it has created. Yeah these and, people at the, and it's, it's like so engaging because it's the most, just like we were saying, just and like, f it's just so like clear cut the belief of like, there are demons, they'll possess you. I can get them out. If you're in a wheelchair, I can get you to walk. If you have cancer, I can get your cancer. Like these are typically like impossibilities of the world, you know? And see, that's, a perfect thing and now we're back but <laughs> but if you tell someone i can heal you of your cancer right and now i start paying you every month and you're like i don't know how long this is going to take so i just keep paying you every single mm. month and then you can't heal my cancer right but you're telling me like well it's out of my hands yeah but then you're flying you actually in jets. don't believe enough that you could be cured i'm sorry something like that <laughs> right so it's like but then you're flying in jets and you have like nice shit and material items then it's like okay, but I didn't have a lot of money to begin with and I'm giving you money every single month because you're telling me something. Yeah. And like, you're making me believe and that's where it gets murky. And like, that's where it's kind of like, well, it's not up to me. I'm a messenger. I, it's like, I'm not making the final decision to heal you or not. I'm just kind of like the messenger and I'm like trying and I'm, you know, whatever, which I think is admirable in some people. But for the people who just know, I just need to make a believer out of this person because they're just a fucking monthly subscription that I can get. That's worse than fucking most things like yeah. it's bad yeah you know and that's why it's it's bad and like that's the difference is because mm -hmm. you're almost promising people something and if you don't deliver 
it's not really your fault. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, but who's to but say? But you still reap the reward. Yeah. 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 So like, that's why it comes off a little bad, but enough of that. Uh, you know, yeah. I, and we're just speaking in general. We're not speaking of the guest. No. In yeah, particular. Not. It's uh You're not. Because there's it, no way of telling. Maybe this guy does have true intentions and he, he like really just wants to help people and this and that. And I think that's admirable. If you really want to help people and this is your way of doing it, fucking okay, do it. And maybe he has the ability and is healing people. Or maybe sure. he doesn't, but he has so much belief that he can that it's like real to him. It, working in that world uh, you know the same way like psychologically someone could have so much faith or believe that maybe they do stand up from their wheelchair maybe they do like beat an illness i I don't know these are the questions that will never be answered yeah uh, in our lifetime uh but yeah for anyone out there that would like to be a guest on our show hit us up our podcast is opl podcast at gmail.com our email is that by the way uh and uh, send us your story and we'll get back to you yeah, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, at OPL Podcast. You can support the show at patreon.com uh, slash OPL show. Um, you can buy us a Porsche if you want, too. <laughs> and that is all. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>